Okay, hi everyone. Um, we are live again. Um, I'm back. Um, for those of you who've been here before, I am Danielle Snowflack. I'm the Senior Director of Education at Edvotech. Um, I'm happy to see you all again here uh, for our sixth biotechnology live stream now. Um, these have been a ton of fun um, and I hope you're enjoying them as much as I am. Um, I'm so happy to be bringing this training to you in the comfort of your own home or lab. Um, and today we're going back to one of our incredibly popular topics, forensic science. Uh, forensic science is an amazing thinking um, and core, uh, common core literacy skills. So um, in, in addition to those, we're going to be talking about a little bit about bioethics today. So we have a great lesson planned and, um, you know, I'm so glad you're joining me from wherever you're joining me from. So um, if you want to let us know where you're from, um, you can put that in the chat. Um, and just welcome. So I know some of you have been with me before, um, but just for those of you who haven't been, um, we are Edvotech. We are the biotechnology education company. Um, we were founded over 30 years ago um, by Georgetown professor of biochemistry, Dr. Jack Trichian. Um, and so now Dr. Trichian was not only um, a biochemist, but an, education, an educator by training. Um, and he was just inspired by the amazing biotechnology going on in laboratories across the world um, and wanted to discover ways to translate that for students, right? So if we think about the mid-1980s in terms of just forensic science, um, this was the advent of DNA fingerprinting. So you have Sir Alec Jeffries who, um, who really developed this technique in the UK to be able to look at the at different markers within our DNA to distinguish between individuals. And so um, little at the at this time in the mid 80s, little of this was being translated into content for the teaching classroom. And so Edvotech was born from that. And so our focus is on making life easier for educators. We operate solely in the education sphere uh, to make biotechnology easy for you to perform and accessible for you and your students. Um, we want to help you demystify science for your students and to foster the next generation of scientists through hands-on active learning activities. So today, uh, today's experiment is DNA fingerprinting experiment. Um, this is going to be a forensic DNA uh, type experiment. Um, we're actually going to be running Two, we're going to be discussing the ways that forensic scientists might analyze crime scene samples that contain DNA. Um, so we're actually going to be running two experiments today simultaneously. Um, both are electrophoresis simulations of forensic DNA fingerprinting. And the kits we're going to be running are Edvotech Kit 109, which uses DNA samples, and Kit S51, which is going to use dye samples. And you can see examples of the gels um, on this slide. So these are both Agros gel electrophoresis experiments where we're going to be separating these molecules based on their physical properties. Um, for DNA, that's going to be based on their size, which I'm going to focus on today. If you're interested in learning more about the chemistry of dye molecules and how they separate, we actually do have a separate live stream in our YouTube library that you could refer to. Um, the dyes, but in brief, the dyes are separated by their charge. Um, and so again, please check that out if you're interested. Um, so to be clear, the samples we're working on today are simulated DNA samples. Uh, simulated uh, human samples. Um, so there's no biohazard to bring into your home or lab. Um, you know, I'm doing these at home, so I always like to make sure that I'm not going to bring anything in that could be a problem. Um, oh, and, oh, and, you know, um, even though, so I'm going to be using proper um, personal protective equipment um, just to protect myself further, but again, there's no biohazard here. Um, and so over the course of this workshop, we are going to be talking about forensic science, human genetics, and then bioethics as it relates to uh, forensic DNA analysis. So this demonstration is being recorded. Um, it will be archived to our YouTube page and the slides will be available on our website. If you'd like to be notified when they're posted, please fill out the form. Uh, the link is already in the chat box. You can see that it was posted by Maria. Um, she is a, an Edvotech employee who will be here on this live stream uh, to help me uh, answer questions, to help me triage questions. Um, so um, please fill out that link. Um, in addition, we are offering professional development certificates to those who are watching live. So if you'd like to, us to send you a certificate, please fill out that form, um, mark off the box that you would like to get the certificate, um, and then uh, we will send it to you within the next few days. 
Um, so this link is only going to be live for the next hour, for the hour after the workshop. Um, we want to make sure that people who are um, getting their certificate are the people who have been with us for the training. So um, the link will only be live for one hour. Um, so be sure to complete it before 3 p.m. Eastern time. So let's get started. Um, for those of you who, are, who uh, were on my last forensic science workshop, this will look familiar, but I want to make sure to get everyone up to speed. So we're kind of starting in the same place. Um, so let's define forensic science. So what is forensic science? Uh, simply put, forensic science is the application of scientific knowledge and methodology to answer questions of interest within legal system, the legal system. So forensic science isn't one science. It's the blending of many techniques from different scientific fields to be able to analyze evidence found at crime scenes. Um, we, we often think of forensic science as doing DNA fingerprinting of crime scene samples, which we're going to cover today, but there's so many more aspects to it that come together to form this field. So in order to answer these legal questions, forensic scientists are going to collect and analyze evidence from the scene of a crime. Uh, they'll keep the evidence secured uh, and note the chain of custody to ensure that it hasn't been tampered with by um, outside parties. And so this is important to make sure that our information, our evidence is not being compromised. Um, along the line, which could give us erroneous, allow us to make erroneous, um, erroneous conclusions based on the evidence that we collect. Um, and furthermore, uh, forensic scientists have to keep great records of their experiments because these results are evidence in court. Um, after analyzing the evidence, forensic scientists often act as witnesses at trials, uh, providing detailed reports and expert testimony. So um, forensic scientists are going to use techniques from multiple different multiple scientific disciplines, as I mentioned on the last slide, um, because forensic science isn't just a single discipline. Assays from many disciplines are used to analyze evidence. And so this slide covers just a sampling of laboratory techniques uh, that forensic scientists use um, in the laboratory. Um, each type of anal analysis requires specialization by the forensic scientist. So um, as an anthropologist, you might not be analyzing um, the chemical uh, the chemical properties of trace physical evidence um, and vice versa. So, for example, um, let's talk about forensic anthropology. This one was really popular a few years ago with the television show Bones, who was a forensic anthropologist. A uh, forensic anthropologist is going to analyze remains in advanced stages of decomposition. Um, the scientist is going to look at the shape and size of bones and teeth to collect information about the um, deceased. Uh, they're going to rely on evidence provided by that skeleton to determine who died, how they died, and when they died. Um, and again, you know, um, this is looking at a material that is in advanced states of decomposition. Um, the, we're going to focus today on genetics and molecular biology. Um, these are going to be, this is where biotechnology really comes into play often. Um, you know, for these tests, uh, the scientist is going to analyze biological materials like blood, saliva, urine, body tissue, and more. Um, Technologies include the use of antibodies to detect whether our sample is blood and then testing the blood type. So we covered that in our previous live stream and you can go back to it if you're interested. Um, you, in today's workshop, we are gonna be discussing DNA analysis of biological samples and how that evidence is used to, uh, by forensic scientists in, in, by forensic science to determine and exclude um, suspects from, from a uh, inquisitive process. Um, forensic toxicology is going to identify poison drugs and or alcohol in blood in bodily tissues. So if you have someone who, um, you know, perhaps was a victim of a crime, you know, you could analyze their blood to determine whether or not they were drugged beforehand. Um, we could use um, alcohol testing to determine if a person was intoxicated while they were driving. Um, there's a lot of different ways um, that this is applied. Um, and again, we're going to, that'll be um, and we have several experiments where you could try toxicology in your classroom too. And, you know, if you're interested, let us know in the chat box or in the forum, and perhaps we could try and perform one of these experiments in a future live stream. Uh, chemistry is going to be used in the analysis of trace physical evidence. Um, forensic chemists, chemists are going to analyze um, drugs, paint, soil, glass, and fibers to determine their composition um, using different techniques. Um, to to look at that to to look at them and be able to distinguish them between samples taken at different locations. Um, pathologists are going to examine the dead bodies to determine the cause of death. Um, so in postmortem 
examinations. The pathologist is going to examine wounds, take samples to send to the biologists and chemists, and then look at the tissue structure to see if there is any evidence there to determine how an individual um, may have been killed. Um, and so if you've seen the television show, Dr. G Medical Examiner, you've seen a pathologist in action. Um, and, and, you know, these TV shows are available and clips can be shown to your students to kind of link what they're doing in the lab to other disciplines um, as well. Um, and so the thread that really is going to connect all of these disciplines is the outcome. Each of these disciplines is going to give us evidence that we can use to build a case. And so today, as I mentioned, we're going to be focusing on DNA fingerprinting to create a genetic profile from crime scene evidence. Uh, Forensic science is a fantastic way to not only teach biotechnology, but to engage critical thinking and literacy skills. Um, you know, using these forensic science scenarios, we can push our students to learn um, not just about biotechnology, um, but to think about different threads of evidence and bring them together, not only the evidence collected in the lab, but also um, in evidence collected through reading witness statements and evaluating alibis before performing the laboratory analysis, looking at crime scene information. Um, and we actually have created a lesson plan. Um, the link is here and it, I'll also email it to you. Um, the link to this, email it to you if you fill out the form. Um, but this um, lesson plan does have some witness statements um, and a uh, a, flow, a workflow to do a blood typing experiment and a DNA fingerprinting experiment together. Um, while performing these tests, your students are gonna keep careful notes documenting the chain of custody of their evidence. Um, plus, if you're incorporating the blood typing exercise with DNA fingerprinting, students are gonna have to connect evidence from two, from actually three separate experiments to come to a conclusion um, for who done it. Um, the students will form their hypothesis and write a persuasive essay to build their case. And then after performing this investigation, your students will have experience with data collection, critical analysis of results, scientific inquiry, and per persuasive writing. And from feedback from teachers at conferences, um, through emails, um, you know, we've found that people, the students really love this kind of DNA investigator scenario, and it really gets them engaged with the material, but it's a really fun way to talk about genetics. So today we're talking about a crime that occurred in the lab. Um, again, this is gonna be roughly based off of what is in that lesson plan. Um, and here is a picture of a lab, you know, after someone broke in. And so granted, if we went to my bench and, you know, my lab, um, it would probably look like that normally, but let's just assume that our scientist is normally very neat, um, keeps their bench clean um, and is doing their experiments. Um, and so this scientist is working in a biotechnology lab and they're developing a vaccine for um, a disease that could potentially, that, that affects a lot of people. And so um, by making this um, vaccine, they are going to be able to um, save a lot of lives. And so, you know, the scientist is working hard in the lab and, you know, we get to, uh, it gets late and they want to go home and have a meal. So um, the next morning, uh, she comes back, we enter the crime scene, and the window to the lab is, we enter the lab and the window to the lab is broken. Um, the scientist found that pages were ripped from her lab notebook, um, valuable samples are missing, and on this, and then the security footage is gonna show that someone stole these reagents. And so upon investigating the crime scene, that broken window has a red fluid on it. Um, in our previous live stream, we determined that it was blood to discuss now, um, now that we know that it's blood, how do we analyze that DNA? Um, and so in this workshop, we're going to be using DNA electrophoresis um, to analyze forensic DNA samples. And so let's look more closely at what you need to do these experiments. So first, you're going to need the samples. Um, you know what? Let me go over to my work area so that I can show you everything as I'm opening it up. Um, so let's talk about um, what we need to analyze forensic DNA samples. So first we're gonna need the samples. Um, electrophoresis is a very versatile technique. Um, it can be used to separate a variety of molecules, nucleic acid, including DNA and RNA um, and proteins. And in today's live stream, we're actually going to be um, using the technique to separate both solutions of DNA and brightly colored dyes. So these samples are going to be in our quick strip format. Um, so it's basically the DNA samples are pre-aliquoted for you to be able to give each one of your lab groups one of these strips 
um, and then they can perform the experiment. So you don't actually have to do any aliquoting before your lab section. It's, everything's already ready to go. Um, Agrios is going to be, let me actually open this box and I can show you some of it, how it comes. Um, so this is our Agros, our Ultra Spec Agros. It comes as a powder, pre-measured um, for the class. Um, Agros is our medium for separation, and we could think about it like a scientific jello. Um, the Agros is going to act like a strainer or a molecular sieve to help us separate molecules by size. And so we're going to talk about Agros and the way it works a little more um, in our live stream. So the electrophoresis buffer we're using is a mixture of buffers and salts. So there are two reasons that we use this buffer instead of water. Um, first, um, you know, this techni technique uses electricity to separate our DNA molecules and water is actually a very poor conductor of electricity. So we need to add salt into the water, um, which is going to allow for the current to flow through the buffer. Um, next, since we are working with biological samples, we're working with DNA, we want to keep them at a pH that, um, you know, keeps them charged. Um, we don't want them to grade and to degrade, and we want to make sure that they, they keep their structure. Um, and so that's, so the, the buffer is an important part of the experiment. And so we actually send the buffer to you as a 50x concentrate. So you're going to dilute this when it gets to your lab. Um, so this is great because we don't have to send you like a gallon of liquid. We are in that way. We're not only saving um, you um, shipping costs. We're also, you know, being able to be greener because we're not shipping um, huge packages. We can really pack a lot of stuff into a truck when it comes to Advotech. Um, and so we actually have a great video on our YouTube channel also about dilutions if you want to learn more um, about how to dilute your buffer. And the instructions are also going to be in your uh, kit literature. Um, so I've already placed the gel and the buffer into the electrophoresis chamber. So let me move that over here and get that lined up. Um, this, is our, this is our M12 electrophoresis chamber. Um, and then here is our power supply. You're probably not going to be able to see that, so I'm not going to bother moving it. But trust me, there is a power supply there. It looks like the purple one in this picture. Um, the electrophoresis chamber is going to be wired at either end um, with terminals that are connected to leads. We connect the leads to a power supply, and that power supply generates the current that we need to, perf we need to perform the separation. Um, and so um, it's, not it's not easy to see the gel in here because the gel is kind of a trans lucent whitish kind of color um, but I'll take the gels out later for you to take a look at and you'll be able to see what the gel looks like. Um, finally we're gonna have to get our samples into the gel. Um, we are going to use an adjustable volume micropipette shown here um, and in that picture and that's going to allow us to make accurate measurements um, to get the samples in the gel. So um, Let's do a, let's take a quick overview of the electrophoresis process. So this is what we're going to be covering today. Um, so after casting the gel, we submerge our gel and buffer and load our samples. We're going to attach the safety cover in the leads and turn on our power supply. That's going to push the current through the gel, um, which is going to move our DNA samples. Um, after about 15 or 20 minutes, we'll check on the results of our experiment. Um, and in this case, we'll either see colorful dye or DNA samples that have migrated into distinct bands. So the first step, um, we'll start from one um, and discuss what we do to prepare for electrophoresis. So the first thing we do is cast the agarose gel. Um, so I actually have, a, let me move this out of the way again, just for a second. Um, so I actually have our casting system set up here. So basically we can think of this as our scientific jello mold. Um, the agarose that you receive in your kit, it comes as a powder, um, much like jello when you buy jello at home. Um, we add the powder to our diluted electrophoresis buffer. We heat it to boiling so that it melts. And then as the solution cools, it solidifies and we were going to, it solidifies taking the shape of our container. Um, so we cast this agarose into a mold that fits into our chamber. Now each electrophoresis system is going to have a slightly different casting system, but the principles are going to be the same. And so if you have a different electrophoresis system, don't worry. You can still work with our, with our experiments. Um, you know, it's just that the casting system is going to be a little different. And so if you have any questions about how to use an Edvotech experiment with whatever kind of electrophoresis equipment you might have, um, reach out to us at info at edvotech.com and we will help you adapt anything because, um, you know, we, our experiments are incredibly versatile. Um, so we have our, our jello mold. 
Um, so what we would do is we take the, the, the liquid all gross, pour it in here, it's gonna solidify. Um, because one thing that's important to remember is that you know we need to have the ends of these chambers open when we're actually running the experiment. So you wanna have the ends of your chamber covered when you're pouring the gel or else the liquid agros is just gonna pour out the side. And so I really love these end caps. Um, you know, I've been using them for years now and um, you know, I've had gels leak with other casting systems or some of you uh, may have experienced this where you use masking tape on the sides of your gel trays um, to get them to, uh, to close them up. And I know that I used to always have gels leak that way. Um, I, I don't think I've ever had a gel leak using these end caps. So they really are a fantastic um, Edvotech advantage. Okay, so we also need to create the wells within our gel where we load the samples. Um, this is done with a comb. Each tooth on the comb is gonna create an individual well and we load one sample into each well. Um, once the gel is solidified, the end caps and the combs are removed. And then we place that gel into our chamber. So let me move our chamber back into frame, that looks good. Let's see, can I see that on the camera? Yes, that looks good. Um, so uh, we remove it, we place the gel into our buffer tank, and then using a transfer pipette or a micro pipette, we're gonna load one sample per well. Um, we attach the safety cover, in which in our case has the leads attached, and we then turn on our power supply. So let's, let's run our gel. So oftentimes in the laboratory, we are loading very small volumes. Um, in this case, we're gonna be loading 35 microliters of each of our samples. Um, so in this case, you're gonna to want to use an adjustable volume micro pipette um, to load these samples. Now you can use transfer pipettes to do it. Um, I find it easier to use a micro pipette, either a variable one like the one we're using today um, or a single volume micro pipette um, just to make it easier to load um, and for greater accuracy. Um, so these adjustable volume micro pipettes are going to allow us to make the same measurement each time. And so I'm not gonna go into how to use this today, um, but we have a great video on our YouTube channel that's gonna show you how to use an adjustable volume pipette. Um, so um, first, um, I'm gonna load the sample. So um, we are going to use, I'm gonna load the DNA sample. Oh, actually, Good thing I looked at my notes. Um, we're gonna load the dye samples on the top gel and the DNA samples on the lower well. Um, and so I'm gonna puncture my quick strip first with my micro pipette. And then I'm gonna use the micro pipette to draw up the liquid. And then I am gonna load that into the wells. And oop, this is not an easy way to load electrophoresis samples. I'm kind of loading around the camera. So it may be a little messier than I prefer, um, but you know, um, I think what you'll see is even with the slight uh, mistakes I may make uh, loading this gel under pressure, um, we're still gonna get great, re great results at the end. Um, and so what you'll notice is I'm gonna change tips between each sample. Um, that's really important, especially in the forensic science laboratory. Um, yeah, there we go. It's especially in the forensic science laboratory because you know you can imagine we want to prevent cross contamination of samples. So um, if we're in a laboratory and let's say we have a crime scene sample and two suspects, if we use the same tips for each of them, um, the, so if we didn't change tips between samples, um, you could imagine that we're going to get all kinds of cross contamination. So all of our samples will end up looking the same, and we won't be able to distinguish. Um, between the suspects and the crime scene samples. And so we change our tips. Um, and this is actually a great way, you know, if for some reason your students did not change the tips or loaded things incorrectly and the evidence um, didn't point, uh, was inconclusive, this is a great way to talk about the nature of science, about how science is messy. Um, you know, science doesn't always work exactly how we plan it. And again, when we go to our lab notebooks, the students will have to explain what happened, what they think happened, and you know how we would get away from that. You know how we would prevent that the next time, um, and you know it also it really helps them not only learn about science as a process, um, but again to really work on those critical thinking, critical literacy skills, and explaining what went wrong and thinking about how they would um, fix it the next time. So every moment, even a mistake, can be a learning moment. Um, and even when our experiments don't work, they really do teach us something. Um, and so here are the, the samples I'm loading. They are in our quick strip format. 
Again, each is pre-aliquoted and they all include the appropriate loading die. Um, so you'll notice as I load the samples, they sink into the wells. Um, the samples are in buffer and buffer is gonna be the same density as water. Um, so if I were to just add these in, you could imagine that they would just float away and we need the samples to stick into the wells. So in our samples, we also have, um, you know, uh, glycerol or another agent that is going to make the samples more dense than water. And so when I load them, the sample sinks into the well. Uh, and when it sinks into the well, oops, you know, there's a little mistake. That's okay. Um, when it sinks into the well, um, we can then separate it by electrophoresis. Um, so I have one more um, strip to load. So I loaded our dye samples. These are going to be our DNA samples. Um, oops. And so um, you can see that these DNA samples um, load just the same way as our dye samples. Um, again, they are more dense than water, um, so they're gonna sink into the wells. And if anybody has any questions right now about loading DNA or pipettes, please feel free to put them in the chat window um, while I'm getting these last couple samples in the gel. Um, we encourage you to ask questions at any time. Um, you know, We really want this to be an interactive experience for you. Um, Now, if you were doing this in your classroom, you would probably be loading the same samples into the top and the bottom gel. Um, so what you can see is that basically we have two, we have two lab groups. So we can have two lab groups of six all loading into this one gel chamber. And so that's 12 students if each loads one sample. <coughs> and um, each person is gonna load one sample um, and it, it's, I think students really like to do this. You know, you are gonna to wanna to have your students practice um, gel loading before doing the experiment so um, that they're comfortable um, loading the gel. Um, and we actually offer something called a DNA Dura Gel. That's gonna be a plastic polymer practice gel that can be washed and reused. So your students can practice with that as much as they want to before actually um, trying to load this gel. So let them get comfortable because this does, this is a learned skill. It's a little um, tricky to do the first time because you have to coordinate both your hands and your elbows and you don't wanna poke down too far into the well um, because then your samples will fall right out of the well and get swept up in the current and you won't get any result. Again, if that happens, it's a teaching moment. Um, you know, let your students um, talk about what went wrong and how they can fix it. All right, so I'm gonna put my lid on here, push it down, turn on the juice. Um, oh, is my power supply? Oh, oh, we're not plugged in. So the juice is not on yet. Um, I tested it last night, but I guess at some point when I was moving everything around this morning, I forgot to replug it back in. All right, so now we're going. <laughs> um, you can see bubbles at both terminals. That's how you know your electrophoresis chamber is on. And that's coming from the hydrolysis of water. Um, so I always like to look for bubbles. Um, after I turn on the chamber, that's the way I know that our electrophoresis is going, okay? So let's talk really quickly about the equipment. So these are um, our gel chambers. So these, this slide is gonna feature two horizontal electrophoresis chambers. We're using an agarose gel, which was cast separately and put into the chamber. Um, the unit I'm using is the M12, which can run up to two gels at once. Again, um, that is going to get, that's going to be two lab groups of six, so we can get 12 students in one chamber. Um, we also offer the M36, which can run six gels at one time. Um, that's a whole classroom, 36 samples in one gel chamber, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, and so again, the electrophoresis chamber holds the buffer. Um, we put our gel in there, we load our samples into the gels, and then there are electrodes wired at both ends which generate the current. And so one electrode is our anode, one, at, one is our cathode, um, and so you can even teach a little electrochemistry as well. So when attached to a power supply, these electrodes generate a current that we need to perform the separation. Um, you can't see it now, um, it is off screen. I wanted to make sure I have the gel on screen, but we are using the Duosource 150 today. Um, which can run two gel chambers at 75 or 150 volts. So if we actually attach two M12s to this one power supply, 
um, the setup could accommodate 24 students, which is four lab groups with six students each. And so um, that's an awesome setup to get electrophoresis into your classroom. Um, and you know, if you have any more questions about this, again, put it in the chat window and we're happy to talk to you more about the equipment and how to get this in your classroom. Um, now, the duo source is gonna be great for the vast majority of the experiments you're gonna do. But if you want to run four electrophoresis chambers at once or maybe do polyacrylamide electrophoresis, you're going to want to consider the quadrosource. The unit is fully adjustable from 10 to 300 volts um, and there's a couple more features on it that you can use um, for some more complex experiments. Okay, so in our lab, let's get to the science now. Oh, I forgot about the edge. Um, now, if you're looking for an all-in-one solution, um, we've just introduced the Edvotech Edge. This unit takes our electrophoresis chamber, our power supply, and our DNA visualization system, and it's going to just put it together into one compact, easy to use unit. It's beautiful, it's sleek, um, it works fantastic, um, and we're super excited by this, um, by this piece of equipment. So, um, you know, we try to accommodate anything you could look for um, in a unit. And so the Edge will give you the edge in electrophoresis. Oh, that's cheesy. But that's okay. Um, so in our last forensic science labs uh, live stream, um, we talked about blood typing um, and the ways we test blood samples to determine whether they're actually blood or not. But what do you do with the sample after you've identified that it's blood? Um, so we're going to want to extract the DNA for analysis. Now, DNA can be isolated from any biological sample um, found at the crime scene, not just blood, but skin, hair, saliva, uh, anything you could imagine. Um, we can't just analyze the sample as it is, though. The DNA is bound up in the cell, and furthermore, it's in the nucleus of the cell. Um, there is, it's bound up in these membranes, and the cell is full of other components. Um, in, I have a very simple schematic of a cell on this slide. Um, I, as you can see, we've got Golgi, lysosomes, mitochondria, ribosomes. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, and so what we need to do is isolate this DNA from all the other intracellular stuff. So the cell walls and the membranes, uh, well, in human cells, you're only gonna have cell membranes. In plant cells and fungal cells, you'll have a cell wall. Um, regardless, we need to disrupt those walls to release the intracellular contents. The resulting lysate is gonna be a big stew, a big mixture, um, which has this contains a cytoplasm, metabolites, DNA, RNA, protein, and organelles. Um, and using D-ethanol precipitation or DNA extraction kits, the DNA is isolated from the rest of the lysate for forensic analysis. So in our case, we are um, isolating DNA from the samples that we found um, in our last live stream. Um, we've identified them as blood, and now we're looking at the DNA. And so again, if you want to learn more about forensic blood testing, check out our past live stream, and it's freely available on our YouTube page. Now, after a sample is confirmed to be human blood, forensic scientists turn to DNA fingerprinting, which is going to analyze that DNA that we just extracted from the blood sample. In humans, DNA is packaged into 23 pairs of chromosomes. Although most of this DNA is gonna be identical between individuals, small sequence differences or polymorphisms are going to occur um, at specific locations throughout the genome. These are heritable differences, meaning that they are from the mom and the dad and they're gonna segregate in a Mendelian fashion. These polymorphisms include single base pair changes and repetitive DNA elements. The polymerase chain reaction um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is actually used to analyze polymorphisms at several different locations within the human genome. Um, so the term DNA fingerprinting is actually an analogy in itself to describe this biotechnology technique. So let's think about actual fingerprinting. Um, we can all take a look at our hands. Um, at the macro level, our hands are gonna look pretty much the same. We each have five fingers on our hands. The fingers are gonna to attach to the palm. Our fingers can bend. Um, our wrists can bend. Our palm attaches to the wrist um, and the wrist to the arm and so forth. Um, you know, and then there will be differences. You know, everyone, there, there's always differences, but generally things are gonna look the same. Um, but when we look at our fingerprints, we can actually see a difference. Uh, each fingerprint is going to be have a unique arrangement of loops and whorls and swirls, which can be used to differentiate from one another, us from one another. So in the same way, the combination of polymorphisms in our DNA can be used to differentiate between individuals. So let's take a look at position A on chromosome 2. This is a locus, um, a specific location on our chromosomes. So let's pretend that this is a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP. 
Uh, this is a location where the sequences are going to differ by a single letter. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of us on this live stream right now. So let's say that I have an A at this position, A on chromosome 2. Um, you might have a T and someone else might have another A. This alone won't tell us much about which of us left the blood sample behind. Um, if there's only two choices, we're going to have, you know, it's not a 50-50 distribution. There's a lot of factors that go into it, including, you know, uh, area of the, the location from where you heard your heritage is from. Um, you know, some of them are linked to uh, mutations that could be linked to hair color or eye color or other kinds of phenotypes. Um, but in general, we're going to have big populations um, that would have either an A or a T. But when we look at the 20 different CODIS loci, 13 of which that I featured here, um, the, feature, the, the results are going to become incredibly specific. Um, so we can imagine if we have 20 loci, if we have an, like a possibility of a 50% um, A versus T at a sp specific location, multiply that by 20, um, we have a huge number. Um, and, you know, the chances of individuals having the exact same DNA profile is just vanishingly small. Um, and you can actually have your students try and calculate it if you want to. It's a good, good way to bring math into your classroom. Um, each individual's genome is going to contain a different combination of polymorphisms and allowing us to generate a unique DNA fingerprint for that person. So CODIS, uh, or the Combined DNA Index System, is the national database of DNA sequences that have been analyzed at these different locations. Um, and basically, this database can be used to compare our evidence uh, to evidence, the, our crime scene evidence, to um, other evidence in the database. This can allow us to identify um, potential suspects or, you know, in missing people, um, etc. Um, so if a sample is found at another location, we can link the two crimes or link the two people. Um, and it can also be used to identify or rule out suspects later in the investigation. So let's talk specifically about some of the landmarks used for DNA fingerprinting. We've already talked about SNPs, that's that A to T difference, the single nucleotide differences, um, where DNA-based pairs at a specific location have variability. Now, some of these DNA sequence differences are called restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or RIFLIPS. So what does this mean in terms of our DNA sequence? Um, so let's step back a second and talk about the restriction enzymes. Um, so a restriction enzyme or restriction endonuclease is a highly specific enzyme that cuts DNA into fragments based on its sequence. It's like a molecular scissor, which can only cut at specific locations based on their sequence. Uh, the sequence has to be exact. So um, if we're talking about ECHOR1, which I have a picture here of the recognition site, um, ECHOR1 only cuts DNA with the specific, sequ specific sequence GAATTC. So let's say that one of those A's is a position where a SNP can occur. So like that A to T difference we were talking about before, um, the enzyme can only cut when there is an A in that location. So here, let's look at a schematic of DNA. Um, this, we can imagine that this is uh, the, the, the greenish lines are a segment of DNA contained between two black arrows. Um, there are two potential reflips here, two potential ECHOR1 cut sites. Um, one indicated by the yellow arrow in DNA sample A, and one by the red arrow in DNA sample B. Um, if we were to just isolate this DNA and run it on a gel, the two would look the same. However, when we cut it with ECHOR1, we're going to see different results. So for sample A, the cut site is, site is closer to the middle of our DNA fragment. So when we run it on a gel, we see two bands that are close in size. In sample B, the cut site is closer to the end, so the two fragments are more different in size. And these differences in the pattern are going to allow us to distinguish between people. Um, if we want to take a look second just to look at the gel, you can see our samples are moving through the gel. You can start to see some separation between the colorful dyes in the top gel, and then the blue samples are moving down further. That's our loading dye that's moving down, and that's going to let us know how far our DNA samples are traveling. Okay, so back to um, RIFLIPS. So another kind of RIFLIP is going to be the variable number of tandem repeat, or VNTR. A VNTR is a short repetitive DNA sequence found at specific locations within the human genome. Uh, the sequence itself is generally 15 to 35 nucleotides long, though they can be as short as two base pairs and as long as several thousand base pairs. Uh, and each of these repetitive D DNA sequences can occur between 5 and 100 times at a specific location. So 
Fan TRs are considered to be a type of RIFLIP because they change the restriction pattern by changing the distance between two enzyme sites. So if we look at the schematic, we're, and in this schematic, we're actually looking at two chromosomes present in one person's DNA sample. Again, these are heritable. So one of these chromosomes is gonna be from mom and one of them is gonna be from dad. Um, we can see that there is a VNTR site between the two ECHOR1 sites. Um, there are more copies of the VNTR present on chromosome B than on chromosome A. So if we ran this sample on a gel, we'd see two distinct bands in one DNA sample. So if you look at that picture of the gel on the bottom half of the slide, um, you can see that there are two bands in that first lane. Um, and that is, gives us information, not only in the number of fragments in between the cut sites on one chromosome, but it allows us to see two different chromosomes. Um, so that's really interesting because it's even more data that's available for us to analyze. So this is our experiment 334, which is gonna analyze one of these VNTR loci, loci, loci yeah, loci, and your students can um, actually do this analysis in the classroom um, once things are back to normal. And so you can imagine how powerful this is for DNA analysis, because now we're not just dealing with cut DNA versus not cut DNA. We have these DNA fragments that can vary in size dramatically based on the number of VNTRs present within a single locus. Furthermore, since the DNA, each person has two chromosomes, and each chromosome has a different number of VNTRs present at a single location, the amount of information we can get from a single point is incredible. Uh, multiply that over all of the CODIS loci, and you can imagine why DNA fingerprinting is so specific and can identify individual people. So in today's forensic science laboratory, uh, rather than cutting out DNA using restriction enzymes, we're gonna amplify DNA using a powerful technique called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. Um, this technique can take the smallest amounts of DNA from the smallest sample found at a crime scene and expand it to great numbers to be used for analysis. Um, it's not a perfect analogy, um, but we can think of this as a DNA photocopier. Start with one copy, and we're going to end up with millions of copies by the end of the experiment. PCR follows the same steps that our cell use used to replicate DNA. And so when I teach PCR, I always like to teach it in the context of DNA replication, which is something your students are going to be familiar with. Um, first, we need to separate the two DNA strands. In the cell, we have the enzyme helicase, helicase, which is gonna unwind the DNA, the double-stranded DNA do, uh, helix, into two separate strands. Um, with PCR, we're gonna heat the sample to 94 degrees C, which is gonna separate the double-stranded DNA. The high heat breaks the hydrogen bonds between the DNA base pairs, um, and this is known as denaturation. Um, next, if we were in the cell, the enzyme primase would come along and build short RNA primers along the DNA strands. This allows the enzyme that builds DNA known as DNA polymerase, to start catalyzing the creation of phosphodiester bonds between DNA nucleotides. Now, DNA polymerase can't just start building DNA on its own. It needs a primer to get started so that it can, it can start that first bond. It can't start a first bond by itself. Um, and so um, primase creates the little RNA primer. In PCR, we can actually design primers to bind and specific to bind to and target specific DNA sequences, like that VNTR. We adjust the temperature of our sample to between 40 to 65 degrees C um, based on the thermodynamics of the primer and the DNA sequence, um, and that's gonna allow our primers to anneal or bind to the complementary base pairs in the genomic DNA. And we call this the annealing temperature and the annealing step. Once the primers are bound, DNA polymerase can start building DNA on each strand of DNA as a template using the strand of DNA as a template. In replication, we would copy the entirety of a chromosome so that we end up with a perfect copy of each of our 46 chromosomes, so the 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, in PCR, we raise the sample temperature to 72 degrees C, which allows polymerase to attach to that primer and start building the nucleotide chain, thus creating copies of the section over the original DNA molecule. Now, in replication, we're done until the cell divides again. For PCR, we're gonna repeat these three steps 25 to 35 times to create a ton of DNA. Um, we use a specialized machine called a thermal cycler to automate the changes in temperature. Each cycle, and in a future live stream, we'll talk more about the specifics of PCR, um, but I just wanna give you an overview. So this specialized thermal cycler um, is going to help us be able to automate the changes in temperature. So back in the day, you would have to move the samples from water bath to water bath at all these different temperatures. And I actually know people who have done that. 
Um, and you could actually do it in your classroom if you wanted to. Um, but the thermal cycler just makes it so much easier. So each cycle, each time we go through these three, three different temperatures, is going to double the number of DNA cop copies in the tube, giving us many millions of copies of DNA before the process is over. So it's going to be an exponential growth of DNA in the sample um, since we're doubling each time. So from 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 16, 32, so on. So if you want to bring math into your classroom, integrating that buzzword STEM, um, have your students actually calculate the number of copies DNA present in your sample after PCR. Start with five copies in, in cycle for 25 cycles. Uh, how much DNA is there in there at the end? You're going to have basically five to the 25. So I could easily spend an hour just discussing PCR, and we intend to do that in a future live stream if you're interested. So let's take a look specifically at DNA fingerprinting. Um, so this is a gel. This is a DNA fingerprinting experiment. Forensic scientists identified a biological sample at the scene of the crime. So that's our blood sample that was found on the window um, in, our, in our scenario. Um, we determined it was human in origin, uh, and we analyzed the DNA using finger fingerprinting techniques. Um, so in this example, we're just going to look at one location in the genome from three different suspects and compare it to the crime scene DNA, which is in our, in our second lane. Now, what you can see is that we have a different banding period pattern in each of the suspect lanes. Um, and when we look at the bands, the banding pattern from the crime scene is going to match with suspect number two. Um, so just looking at this one location, it looks like suspect two may have been at the crime scene. So since we're only looking one spot in the genome, uh, we can't make any conclusions from this evidence about suspect number two. You know, it's only one spot and we have many different locations within the genome that we can analyze to um, give us these results. But since they don't match at this one spot, we can likely rule out suspect one and three. Now, we'd have to look at the additional CODIS loci um, before making any final conclusions. So... Um, you may have heard about DNA fingerprinting a lot in the news lately because of a new application of the technology, which is called forensic genealogy. So remember, a person's DNA is inherited from both parents, 50% from the mom and 50% from the dad. Um, and using Mendelian genetics, we can calculate the probability that each of the offspring will have a specific genetic combination. So in this example, we have two parents that are heterozygous at one locus. So that's going to be that orange spot versus that yellow spot on the pedigree that I have on the left side of this slide. Um, these parents have four kids. Um, each child has a 50% chance of re receiving a specific chromosome from each parent. So we have a 25% chance of the child being homozygous for either allele and then a 50% chance for them to be heterozygous at the location. So using these genetic principles, a person's parentage, meaning their maternity and their paternity, can be determined from a child's DNA profile. And so for example, um, on this gel, we have a simulated paternity test. Uh, we have the mom in lane two, the child in lane three, and then two potential fathers in lanes four and five. By comparing the DNA profile of the mother and her child, um, it's possible to identify which bands in the child's DNA sample are, um, are given from the mother's DNA and which are not. And so any bands that are not rep represented in the mother's sample must have been um, provided to the child by their, their father. And so if we're looking at these banding patterns, um, we can rule out dad number two. The, if we're, the DNA sample at, in lane four contributes those two bands that are not contributed in the child sample that are not contributed from the mother's sample. Now, one awesome thing about DNA sequencing technology is that it's getting faster and cheaper every day. So instead of just sequencing paternity DNA for paternity or for forensics, um, you know, individuals can actually sequence their own DNA to learn more about their ancestry. Certain genetic markers can be linked to different ethnic groups. Um, they're called haplotypes. Um, and, you know, again, this is a fascinating topic, which we can discuss further in another live stream. Um, but given that these markers are inherited, we can use them to identify family members. And so um, you may have heard, about, again, you may have heard about this in the news lately. Um, in 2010, a group of amateur genealogists created a database for people to upload their DNA sequences. These were to be used for people to identify family members, um, either near or distant, using markers in their DNA. To date, this D D database, called GEDmatch, has over 1.2 million profiles and it's growing every day. Now, while most were using this for genealogy, um, detectives in California decided to use the database to help generate leads for a cold case. 
There was a criminal in California who was responsible for multiple burglaries, sexual assaults, and murders from the mid-70s to the mid-1980s. And so this was the Golden State Killer. Um, this time, You probably heard about this. It was very big news a few years ago, and, and even today. Um, this was before DNA technology, so the perpetrator didn't like try to prevent leaving DNA evidence behind. Um, for years, detectives could link the cases based together based on the DNA, um, but there were no matches, matches in CODIS. It was almost like the person had just absolutely disappeared. Um, and there's a book that I keep meaning to read, I haven't, um, which covers the case. And so, um, you know, there was all this evidence and we just couldn't, the, the detectives just couldn't link it to anybody. And so the detectives were at an impasse for years. Um, but with the advent of this DNA sequencing, the scientists, the, the detectives took a DNA sample, had it sequenced, and then uploaded it to GED Match. It turns out that family members of this person, of this suspect, had uploaded their DNA sequences to these genetic genealogy websites. And this allowed the detectives to, to identify potential suspects, get warrant for the DNA, and then make an arrest, which has recently resulted in a guilty plea. And so, um, in this picture, we see the genetic detective, Cece Moore. She's in a, no sh in, in a new show um, that is on television right now. And she's perhaps one of the most famous genetic genealogists. And she has a whole TV show based on tracking down people. Um, this is including birth parents, long lost family members, um, and criminals using these DNA databases. But one reason why I think it's so important to cover this in class is that it's gonna give you an opportunity to talk about bioethics with your students, which is incredibly important in this day and age with all of this DNA sequencing information. Um, for example, is it ethical to use this information to identify potential suspects? Um, you know, the suspect themselves isn't, they're not uploading the DNA. Um, we're getting this based on familial DNA matches. Do your family members have a right to privacy if you upload your DNA information? So if my brother he uploaded his DNA information, you're an insurance company um, or you know other people could learn a lot about my DNA sequences because we're closely related. So what are the ethical implications there? Do you have the right to privacy of that information? And so there are no right answers to these questions. Um, they're really a, a fertile area for discussion. And so, but it's another place to have your student read the literature, watch the TV shows or the clips on YouTube and form an opinion. And then this can be used to write a persuasive essay, um, again, bringing in those common core literacy skills. So let's get back to today's experiment, DNA electrophoresis. Um, just to recap before the workshop, I cast the agarose gel. Remember that's our scientific jello. We placed the gel into the gel chamber where it was covered with electrophoresis buffer, loaded our DNA samples using an adjustable volume micropipette, put the lid on the chamber, and turned on the power supply to generate the current necessary for electrophoresis. And actually, I am going to stop the sample right now and take the lid off so you can take a look at the samples, um, how well they've separated in like the 20 minutes or so since I started the gel. Um, so while we were discussing DNA fingerprinting, our samples were separating into different bands based on their size. So let's talk about what's happening inside the gel. And again, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box. You know, I'd love to be able to answer any questions you may have about the technique. Um, so next slide. So what does it mean um, when we add the samples to the wells and apply current? So in this experiment, we are using agarose gel electrophoresis to separate DNA fragments by size or dyes by charge. Um, I'm, again, I'm gonna focus on DNA um, in this workshop. If you're interested more in learning about the dyes, we have a previous live stream that you can refer to. Um, so thinking about the chemical structure of DNA, um, the sugar phosphate bonds that hold the nucleotides together um, gives the DNA a strong negative charge. So this DNA backbone um, is gonna make our DNA charge negatively. So in our gel, um, we're gonna locate the, the wells of the gel near the negative electrode of the gel. We load our samples and we turn on the current. And so the current is gonna push the DNA from the negative side of the gel to the positive side of the gel. Now let's talk a little bit about the molecular nature of this gel. And so at first glance, the agros gel appears to be solid at room temperature. If you were gonna pick it up and squeeze it, it feels like a firm jello. It's thick, it's still soft, but it's a little bit less jiggly than your favorite um, jiggly dessert. Um, at the molecular level, um, the gel is full of pores. So these are microscopic little tunnels that are gonna go through the gel. Um, and we actually call this a molecular sieve. 
Um, these tunnels are going to affect how the different sized DNA molecules actually are able to migrate through the gel um, and form different bands. So as the current is pushing and pulling the DNA fragments through the gel, the molecules have to find their way through these pores. They may have to twist or turn or change their conformation. They may need to unwind a little bit to be able to get through the channels. And since it's easy for small molecules, smaller molecules to get through the gel than larger molecules, the DNA is going to separate into different bands by size. Larger molecules are going to remain closer to the wells and smaller molecules are going to be able to travel further through the gel. Um, because these molecules are going to with different sizes are going to travel at different speeds, they become separated and form discrete bands within the gel. So if we're looking for an analogy for electrophoresis, and I love analogies, um, I think they help make these principles a lot more clear, um, but I like thinking about DNA molecules like fish swimming down the river. We have some fish that are large and some fish that are small. They're moving downstream with the current, which relates back to our electrical current. We have rocks in the river or maybe a fishing net that spans from bank to bank. Um, these obstacles are going to get in the way of the fish as they progress down the stream. Smaller fish can navigate through tight twists and turns or fit through the holes in the net more easily than the large fish. We can think of the fish as our DNA molecules, the current of the stream as our electrical current, and the obstacles like our DNA matrix. So if we look at the results from a DNA experiment, we have smaller bands at the top, at the bottom of the gel and larger bands at the top. And we always run a molecular weight marker with our DNA bands of known size so that we can determine the sizes of our unknown DNA fragments in our experimental samples. Um, so we have one more problem. If you can look at this bottom gel, um, what you see is you can't see our DNA bands. Um, DNA is both clear and colorless. Um, so we need to visualize it using a stain that sticks to DNA. There are many DNA stains available for use in the classroom laboratory, um, but I'm gonna talk about two of my favorite, which are Flash Blue and CyberSafe. CyberSafe is a fluorescent dye that binds to DNA. Each DNA molecule will be decorated with this molecule when you add it to the gel. And then we visualize it using blue, blue DNA, blue light, to excite those molecules and emit, emit light. Um, this is very sensitive because each excited dye molecule can emit a lot of photons of light. So um, one DNA molecule might bind to a million pieces of CyberSafe and each one can continually emit light once when it's excited. Um, but it's going to require a blue light system or a UV visualization system, which not everybody has. And so there are visible DNA stains as well. Um, I'm going to pull this out on the next slide. I just want to get through this last little discussion, and then I'm going to pull out all the gels for analysis. Um, so there are two ways that we can use flash blue to stain the DNA. One is a quick protocol that can be done in around 20 minutes or so. Um, I actually use an overnight protocol where you dilute flash blue um, and soak the gel in it for three hours to overnight. And this is a great option if you have short lab periods because you can basically put the gel in the flash blue, blue after it's run, leave and then come back and then next day it will be, um, your results will be um, able to be analyzed. So let's analyze our samples. So let me move this gel chamber out of the way. I don't want to make a huge mess, so I'm going to bring this paper towel down. Um, I've been staining this gel overnight. Let me get it out of the chamber. Oh, I have a nice and tight lid on there so that my children or my cat does not go into that jar. Um, and so here's the gel. Um, and so I hope you can see, um, you know, it's ideally you would have a blue light, a uh, white light visualization system um, shining up from below so that you can see a greater contrast in the bands. Um, I have a picture of the same gel um, on the screen in case you can't see it clearly, but looking at the replay, it looks like you can actually see the bands pretty well. Um, so in this gel, um, what you can see is that the DNA in each of the lanes created different patterns. Um, in this example, DNA, we're, look, we're analyzing um, DNA from two different loci using DNA fingerprinting. Um, so we analyze two different places in the genome and just for ease, we're gonna call them A and B. Um, and so on this gel, we can see the results which are based on the banding patterns from each sample at A and B. Now, if we were just looking at loci A, we would not be able to make any conclusions from the evidence. So if we look at all three samples, the crime scene sample, suspect one and suspect two, we see the exact same banding pattern in all three of those lanes. So we wouldn't be able to make any conclusions from that evidence. But by adding in the second, loc the second locus, we can actually rule out suspect number one. So you can see that crime scene and suspect number two have the same banding pattern in that location. Um, and so um, from this experiment, it looks like suspect two might have been at the crime scene 
um, but we'd have to look at the additional loci. We'd have to take in more of, we'd have to take more evidence into account um, before making any conclusions. And so here is the DNA sample, the, the dye samples as well. Let me bring up that picture. And so the DNA, dye samples in this experiment have actually been chosen to replicate the banding pattern from the last experiment. So if you don't want to use the DNA, if you want to use the dye samples, um, which are fast and easy to visualize, um, you know, you can still do the DNA forensics experiment. Again, if we just look at locus A, we can't distinguish between the two suspects. All, all, all three of the samples look the same. However, when we look at both sites A and B, we can eliminate suspect number one. Wow, so we are at the end. So let me wrap up really quickly. Um, so we've come to the end of the experiment. Um, we've covered a lot of information over the course of our hour together. Um, a quick recap. If you have any questions, put them in the chat window now and I will answer them for you. Um, so in brief, forensic science is the application of scientific methodology to answer legal questions. Um, the tools for forensic analysis are drawn from many different disciplines, including biotechnology. Um, we, today, we discussed how DNA can be analyzed and used to identify family members um, and suspects in a crime. DNA fingerprinting is going to identify heritable differences in an individual's DNA. We use PCR to amplify regions of DNA that vary between individuals. Um, and then we use agarose gel electrophoresis to rapidly separate those molecules into discrete molecules based on their size. And so while this experiment is fairly simple, I mean, we just did it together this afternoon. Um, now, if you were staining with the, the flash blue, again, you would need a little bit more time, um, but you can see the dye samples um, separated really nicely, really quickly. Um, if you're using the edge with that cyber safe, we would be able to watch the DNA molecules migrate by in real time. Um, but I think what I, what I want you to really take home is that this experiment is fast and easy. It can be done anywhere. Um, you know, uh, it is, it's fast and easy, but it's incredibly powerful when it comes to being able to separate these molecules um, into different pools from one another. And so, um, you know, while it's important to recognize how powerful this technique is, it's also important to address that when we're talking about techniques like forensic genealogy, while they're exciting, there are a lot of ethical implications that are brought up through the technology. And we need to make sure to address these in class with our students. Now, again, data from a crime scene can suggest that a suspect was at the crime scene, but that data alone cannot convict a person of crime. Many lines of evidence, including witness statements and alibis, um, must come together to build the case of the against a suspect. And the results can be used as evidence in the court of law. So um, that is the end of my presentation. Um, we will be posting this presentation and the slides in the next few days to our website. Again, fill out the form that's posted there. Um, if you would like us to email you when everything is available on the website, um, and we'll contact you in a few days. Um, if you have any questions, ask them now. Um, I'm going to start talking a little bit about ways you can get in touch with us. One great way um, is by phone, 1-800-EDVOTECH. Um, if you have questions about the kits, you can email us at info at edvotech.com. Um, you're watching on our YouTube channel, um, but more than our YouTube channel, you can follow us on Edvo on um, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, we're pretty responsive through all channels, um, so we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you do any of these experiments, tweet us a picture. Um, we'd love to see the results from your experiments or any other experiments you might do. Um, we're trying to get everybody to do uh, you know, biotechnology at home. We know how difficult things are, are gonna be in the next semester. Um, so if you have any questions about how to work with that, email us at curriculum at edvotech.com and we can help you try to put together our combination of demonstrations and at-home experiments that you could do, um, which would supplement your, your distance teaching. Um, and again, if you want that professional development certificate, please fill out that form in the next hour. I will be taking that link down um, at 3 p.m. So um, if you joined us for this workshop um, and you would like a certificate to try and get some professional development credit for your home institution, um, please be sure to fill that form out. So thanks again. Um, it's been my pleasure to discuss this experiment with you. We look forward to helping you get biotechnology in your classroom um, or in your distance learning. Um, so stay safe, everybody, and we will see you for the next live stream. Have a great day.